We would like to thank Amgen, for providing an unrestricted grant, to support the IACH webinar series. Hello, my name is Naval Davar. I'm a faculty in the Department of Leukemia at the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Today, it's my pleasure to give this uh, webinar on targeted therapies in acute myeloid leukemia, current and future directions. Thank you very much for uh, logging in and listening. So uh, these are my disclosures uh, shown here. Uh, and moving towards the uh, topic here, we're gonna be talking about the application of molecular studies in acute myeloid leukemia. Uh, one of the things you uh, have noticed is that there are many different targets now that have emerged as potential approaches to uh, attack leukemia. This include FLT3 mutations, IDH1 and 2 mutations, NPM1 mutations, and now most recently drugs that may have specific activity both for TP53. This includes a class of drugs called CD47 serp alpha antibodies. And then also, very importantly, a group of drugs that are showing encouraging activity in MLL rearranged uh, acute myeloid leukemia and acute lymphoid leukemia. This includes the group of menin inhibitors such as Syndax, Cura, and others. Now, RAS is another important uh, mutation for which there are a lot of efforts to develop targeted therapies. Unfortunately, at this time, nothing yet has shown clear promise or benefit, but this is an important mutational group because we know that RAS plays a major role in driving resistance to both FLT3 mutations, IDH mutations, and to venetoclax-based therapy. So it's kind of an important common resistance pathway that we have to find a way to tackle. And hopefully with ongoing trials, we will have some success in the next couple of years. So first talking about FLT3, and, and the reason I think this is the most important is because it's also the most common in AML. So FLT3 mutations make up about 30 to 35% of all acute myeloid leukemia. This includes two major types of FLT3 mutations. One is called the ITD mutation, which is the more common one. 80% of all FLT3 mutations are ITD. And the second one, the less common one, making about 20% of all FLT3 are the TKD. It's also important to note that the type of FLT3 inhibitors uh, may impact what mutations they can actually target. So there's a group of type 2 FLT3 inhibitors. These include drugs like sorofenib quizartinib, which are very effective and powerful FLT3 inhibitors, but they only can target the FLT3 ITD, which is the inactive conformation. So if a patient has a TKD, also called DA35, or a ITD with a TKD mutation, then sorofenib quizartinib are not going to be our first choice FLT3 inhibitors. On the other hand, the type 1 FLT3 inhibitor is the best one known among this group, girtritinib, but others include cronolinib and um, mitostorin, covers both the ITD and the TKD or DA35. Uh, now, that does not mean we don't get resistance to the type 1 inhibitors. It just means that the type of resistance is different through off-target mutational acquisitions, such as mutation in the RASMAP, kinase, PTPN11, BCR able. And so this is important because it means that these drugs are different. They work on different mutations, and it may be possible to use them sequentially, getting the long term benefit. So, starting with giltritinib, which is the first uh, FLT3 inhibitor that was in, uh, approved in the relapsed refractory setting, this is a very powerful, effective FLT3 inhibitor. This is the phase three admiral randomized uh, study that was completed and published by Dr. Sasha Pearl in the New England Journal of Medicine. Here, what you see is that in relapsed refractory AML, a flit 3 mutated patient use of single agent giltritinib oral targeted therapy versus salvage high dose intensive chemotherapy gave us doubling of both the CR and the CRC rates. And quite impressive that oral single agent targeted therapy could give us more than 50% remission. And so this study really established that no patient in relapsed refractory FLT3 mutated AML situation should not get FLT3 inhibitor. Now, you can also see that in spite of the improved response rates and survival, the median survival is only about nine and a half months, and the two-year survival is less than 20%, even with giltritinib. So what it, the study also shows is that, yes, FLT3 inhibitors are very important and critical in relapsed refractory FLT3 AML, but also that they probably are not going to be sufficient as single agents, and optimally, to get the full benefit, we need to combine them with other therapies, such as with chemotherapy, HMA, or venetoclax. So that brings us to where we are currently and where we're trying to develop these FLT3 inhibitors to enhance the benefit beyond what we're seeing with a single agent, which is a good beginning, but really not enough 
for long-term use. And here we see some of the preclinical data. This was actually uh, done by uh, Marina Konopleva and MD Anderson in collaboration with AbbVie and Genentech Labs. Similar work has been published from the Dana-Farber group and the Ohio State group, all showing a very potent synthetic lethality and synergy between FLT3 inhibitors and venetoclax. One of the very uh, interesting things is that FLT3 inhibitors also downregulate MCL1, which is the key uh, anti-apoptotic pathway of resistance to venetoclax. And so you kind of have a dual benefit with FLT3 inhibitors combined with venetoclax, where they're directly targeting the FLT3 receptor, but also blocking MCL1 and th this way avoiding the emergence or delaying the uh, emergence of resistance to venetoclax or BCL2-based therapies. So that then led to this ongoing clinical trial that was last presented by Dr. Altman at the EHA meeting, combining venetoclax with giltritinib in relapsed refractory FLT3 mutated AML. Uh, the study has now completed accrual, will be updated at the ASH 2021 uh, meeting. And overall, what we see is that the response rates were very, very encouraging, 80% uh, CRC response using the same response criteria that were used in the Admiral study. And as you recall, in the Admiral study a few slides ago, I showed that the CRC rate was about 50%. So now going up to 80%. Overall, well tolerated. We did not see any severe or unexpected new toxicities. However, we do see cumulative myelosuppression. And this is something we are seeing with venetoclax-based combinations, whether it's HMA venetoclax, chemo venetoclax, FLT3 venetoclax in salvage. And this requires some expertise and understanding of how to use venetoclax, dose interruptions, modifications, use of growth factors. But if done appropriately and in experienced hands, we can get very high remission rates and a good path to get these people to transplant. A couple of important things from this study. In this study, majority of patients, 65 to 70%, had received a prior FLT3 TKI, such as mitostorin or serofinib with their prior chemotherapies. And so this was a quite a difficult population, actually more difficult than Admiral, where majority 90% of studies had not received a prior TKI before getting giltritinib. And the second is that the molecular clearance, which more and more becoming the key endpoint we're looking at in FLT3, NPM1, and some mutational groups was quite encouraging at 60% compared to about 20% molecular clearance that has been published with giltritinib alone. So this is ongoing. Uh, we're very encouraged by this and uh, hopefully we will get the final data soon. Then uh, we said, well, if the FLT3 inhibitor and venetoclax combos are so good, could we now move this up front and of course use the HMA backbone? So HMA venetoclax, which is the current established frontline therapy for older unfit AML in the US, adding to that the FLT3 inhibitor in the FLT3 mutated subset. And this is kind of just a early look at what we're hoping to see. This was a analysis of about 70 patients at MD Anderson treated over the last five, six years who got either HMA with the FLT3 inhibitor, it could have been sorofenib, it could have been giltritinib, quizartinib, or HMA venetoclax with one of those FLT3 inhibitors. And what you can see in the bar graph is that the HMA venetoclax plus FLT3 inhibitor gives you about double the PCR and flow response rates of what you would get with just HMA FLT3 inhibitor. And so this is quite striking that the addition of venetoclax uh, really can improve the depth of response in addition to the CRC rates. And here you see a survival curve showing that the HMA VEN FLT3 seems to be improving survival. Now, again, it's early uh, uh, data with the patient numbers small, but this will be updated. And we do think that this triple therapy combination, again, done in experienced hands with people who know how to adjust venetoclax can use uh, prophylactic antibiotic antifungal with good monitoring uh, of the myelosuppression could be a very effective therapy in the future. Uh, another FLT3 inhibitor just to mention uh, is a drug that is called Quizartinib, a very powerful FLT3 ITD targeted uh, drug that actually did show improvement in both response rates and survival in the relapse refractory phase three quantum R study. Unfortunately, has not been approved yet in the US, Europe, although it was approved in Japan, but there is now a frontline study called the Quantum First Study of 3 plus 7 quizartinib versus 3 plus 7 that has completed accrual. And we hope to see those results in the very near future. And we are hoping that those results will get quizartinib approved in the frontline setting as well as a new combination of quizartinib plus intensive chemo. But we have to wait for those data to read out. So now moving towards IDH, which is not as common as FLT3. As I said, FLT3 was about 30 to 35% of all newly diagnosed AML, IDH is about 15 to 18%, but still a reasonable, uh, sizable group of patients. 
So here we're just looking at the response rates that we have seen with single agent as well as combination IDH inhibitors over the last few years. And as you can see with single agent IDH inhibitors, the remission rates were about 30% or so in relapsed refractory IDH mutated AML. And that is actually how these drugs were approved by the US FDA as well as in other parts of uh, the world. However, when you combine the AZA with IDH inhibitor, that actually significantly improves the response rate going from 30% almost double to about 60%. Uh, and so our approach at MD Anderson has been to combine IDH inhibitors with an HMA or with an HMA venetoclax backbone, this way harnessing the maximum benefit of the targeted therapy, uh, not just the single agent, uh, which is giving us about 30% response. Now, interestingly, HMA venetoclax also seems to have a high sensitivity and response towards IDH mutated AML. And here you can see that the remission rates were closer to 80% in IDH mutated AMLP treated with HMA venetoclax with encouraging survival up to 50 to 60% alive at three years and ongoing. So unlike FLIP3 and TP53, where HMA ven does not have a very favorable uh, long-term survival with IDH, HMA ven seems to do extremely well. So that led to the question, well, IDH inhibitors are effective and HMA ven is effective. So how do we move this field forward to get the best efficacy and improve long-term remissions upfront in our newly diagnosed AML. Now, one of the nice pieces of information that has come out, this was presented at the ASH meeting in 2020, is that you can salvage patients who have received IDH inhibitor-based therapies with venetoclax-based therapies and vice versa. So on the left, you see people who had received IDH-based therapies, either HMA, IDH, IDH alone, IDH with chemo, and when they relapsed HMA VEN, we were able to get a response in seven out of eight patients. So HMA VEN was effective post IDH inhibitor. On the other hand, people who had failed HMA VEN based therapies who had IDH mutation, these could be salvaged with IDH based therapies. And so it shows you that there are unique synergies between these combinations of IDH VEN and IDH HMA VEN that can give you a response even in those who have just failed HMA uh, VEN. And so to this point, we then developed a triple therapy combination of IDH inhibitor HMA venetoclax. This includes both frontline and salvage patients. The frontline response rate is excellent at greater than 90%. And we see MRD negativity in the majority of these patients, 60% having MRD and their responses are durable with prolonged survival. So to us, this looks like the best approach to go up front. You know, many people do say, well, I would like to reserve the IDH for salvage or the venetoclax for salvage. I mean, historically over the last 40 years, one of the things we have seen is that there is no reserving anything in AML. Once AML relapses, outcomes are dramatically poor, no matter what therapy you use. And we have always seen the best success, especially when we're looking to improve long-term cure rates by uh, optimizing and improving our frontline therapy. And this has been a theme in both AML, ALL. And so our approach is to optimize frontline therapy so we can really get upfront a very deep molecular MRD negative remission, which will hopefully improve the long-term cure fraction. And here you are seeing with the combination of the venetoclax IDH HMA, again, small numbers and early follow-up, but at least looking very promising with the 12 month survival greater than 75% in newly diagnosed AML with this uh, HMA Ven IDH. So now moving to salvage approaches or intensive chemo combo, we have not forgotten intensive chemo. We don't think we're ready to completely move away from intensive chemo. Uh, we do think that there's still a role for intensive chemo in specific age group subsets of patients. But to see why we're excited with some of the new uh, intensive chemo combos, it's important to get historic background. So here you see in patients who received various salvage regimens with different chemotherapy combinations, flag IDA, HIDAC, HMA, MEC, whatever different chemo regimen or combination you use, the response rates were about 25 to 30% with median survival of three to five months. Um, so yes, you could get a response and you could get some uh, benefit, but overall this was quite uh, depressing. So now we said, well, venetoclax is so good in combination with HMA, combination with combination IDH. What would it do in combination with intensive chemotherapy? Would it be tolerable? And if so, would it increase the depth of response? And so this was our regimen of flag IDA venetoclax, which is now ongoing, was published very recently in the JCO by Dr. DiNardo. And here you see we have adjusted the venetoclax down to 14 days. Cytarabine is 1.5 gram per meter square 
uh, not the two gram per meter square. And even the IDA, we dropped it. And we did those modifications because we knew that the addition of enteroplax would cause cumulative myelin suppression. But with those modifications and shortening the vent to 14 days, of course, with close monitoring, prophylactic antibiotic, antifungal, antiviral, use of growth factors if needed at the end of the cycle, we are seeing good tolerability of this regimen. And of course, the key is that we're seeing very encouraging response rates, especially in the relapse refractory AML. If you look at the second column, 39 patients treated and the CRCRR rate is close to 70%, with 70% of those being MRD negative. So seeing a 70% MRD negative remission rate in majority of patients in relapse refractory AML is something we have never seen with any other regimen uh, in acute moderate leukemia. So this looks very, very promising. And you see the overall survival at this time, even in relapse refractory AML is at greater than 50% at one and a half years and ongoing, uh, which looks very, very uh, encouraging. So in the end, just talking briefly about immunotherapies, uh, there are many different immune agents that are entering for acute myeloid leukemia are becoming more and more important. Uh, and this includes targeted therapies, uh, which may be using antibody drug conjugates towards CD33, CD123, CLL1, but also potentially T cell enhancing uh, strategies such as PD1, PDL1, bispecifics, and now most recently, NK cell or macrophage activating strategies. Uh, and I think that in the near future, we're going to see that T cell or CD47 based therapies could be very important players in low burden disease in some of the TP53 and other high risk subsets. So among the immunotherapies, the one that's probably most exciting at this time is a drug CD47 antibody called medrolumab. This is now being evaluated in a phase three frontline randomized placebo controlled study where we're using azomegrolumab versus azovenetoclax or three plus seven. And the idea here is that azomegrolumab, we hope will improve both remission rates and survival compared to investigator choice therapy of azoven or seven plus three. And this is based of course on data that has already been shown from the ongoing single arm phase one B study that azomegrolumab can generate up to 70% remission and greater than 12 months survival in TP53 mutated AML. But of course, the next question is also, do we need to compare and compete AZAVEN versus AZIDH, AZAVEN versus AZAMAGRO, or should we use all our best shots up front to really cure out the leukemia and improve survival? As I mentioned, that's kind of the direction we have been taking. And so again, here we have developed an AZAVENETOCLAX megrolumab triple therapy approach, uh, which is ongoing, and we will be presenting the data at the ASH meeting, and overall looks very, very tolerable. The good thing about adding megrolumab to azaven is that megrolumab does not have a neutropenia thrombocytopenia risk, and so we do not see a very significant cumulative myelosuppression, uh, and of course, uh, the efficacy will be discussed when the data is presented in the near future. Also looking at uh, other approaches to combine with azaven. We are adding a CD123 antibody called IMGN632, which has been very potent and generally very well tolerated. And there is a triple therapy combination of the Azov and IMGN ongoing that will also be presented and updated at the ASH 2021 meeting and actually looks like a very potent combination, especially in relapsed AML patients uh, who have not received prior VEN where we're seeing very high response rates. So in summary, I think the next steps for us is how we can improve on the HMA venetoclax based treatments. Uh, you know, there are many different uh, targeted therapies, immunotherapies, CD47 based approaches, and even other novel approaches that are being added based on biological preclinical rationale to the HMA event to improve both the response rates and more importantly, the depth of remission, MRD and um, molecular clearance, as well as hopefully long term survival. And so I think. In the near future, uh, HMA event FLIT3, HMA event IDH, maybe HMA event CD47 and such strategies will help us get that survival curve that we have with HMA event, which is at about 30, 35% higher, closer to hopefully 60, 70%, which is our goal and what we're looking for. And with that, I would like to stop and thank you very much for listening.